Thanks very much, Sergio, and welcome to everyone on this uh, not the, the brightest evening of the, of the year. So really appreciate you coming out. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here and, um, and a distinct privilege and a pleasure to introduce our guest this evening, Dr. Pranab Bardhan, and the subject of his talk. From Warsaw to Wisconsin, from Budapest to Bangalore, citizens around the world have become disenchanted with democracies in recent years. Many question the capacity of traditional liberal institutions to satisfy their demands. Others even disparage the values of tolerance, pluralism, and diversity. Commentators on the left frequently ascribe these political changes, as we know, to deeper forces, especially the rise of economic inequality. Resurgent nationalism and political majoritarianism are predictable responses, they argue, to the failures of capitalism in a neoliberal era. Yet is inequality the main culprit? Or is insecurity, economic and cultural, more to blame? What explains the decline of social democratic politics in the last few decades? And can anything be done to revive its promise in a post-pandemic world in the face of accelerating climate change? Our guest this evening has just published a deceptively slim book, I say deceptive because it has a global perspective, that examines these issues. Pranab Bardhan is a distinguished professor emeritus of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. An internationally renowned scholar of political economy, rural development, and international trade, he studied at Presidency College, Kolkata, and the University of Cambridge in England, before going on to teach at MIT, the Indian Statistical Institute, and the Delhi School of Economics, and then eventually joining Berkeley. A former chief editor of the flagship journal of the discipline, the Journal of Development Economics, and co-chair of the MacArthur Foundation's Network on the Effects of Inequality on Economic Performance, Professor Bardhan has published more than 30 books. Economists are not known to publish books, let alone 30 of them, and 150 articles in leading economics journals. He's held distinguished visiting professorships at Cambridge, Oxford, and the LSC, and he regularly contributes to major international newspapers and periodicals, from the New York Times, Scientific American, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, to Bloomberg Quint, the Hindustan Times, and the Indian Express. And he also writes a popular blog for Three Quarks Daily. He was just telling me earlier today that his memoirs have been serialized in this and will be coming out uh, in the coming year. Many features distinguish his scholarship, but three have struck me personally since I first read his short masterpiece, which some of you in the audience will have read too, The Political Economy of Development in India, almost 30 years ago when I first read it. The first is his ability to use concepts, theories, and insights from across the social sciences, not simply economics or political science, to provide an integrated account of whatever topic he is examining. A second feature is his concise, often sparkling prose, which reveals great clarity of thought, a virtue all too absent in contemporary social science as we know. And the third is his willingness to challenge theoretical doctrines and political shibboleths among fellow travelers on the left where he himself is based. Political solidarity never seems to come at the expense of intellectual integrity or heterodox ideas. The subject of Professor Bardhan's talk this evening is his latest book, A World of Insecurity, Democratic Disenchantment in Rich and Poor Countries. He will speak for approximately 30 minutes. I'll then start a conversation with him to explore some of the arguments in the book before we open up the floor to your questions and comments. Please join me in welcoming Pranav Bardhan. Thank you, Sanjay, for those um, overly generous remarks. Uh, thanks to the Frontlines of Democracy group for inviting me to give this lecture and have this conversation with Sanjay. And thank you all for braving this uh, rainy, cold evening to come to listen to us. Um, Sanjay has already introduced uh, the, the, the way I look at this subject of democ democratic disenchantment that's going on uh, all over the world. Um, I'll actually, since the time is short, for about half an hour I'll talk. Uh, I will not go over all, many of the features in the book. Um, the book, of, I presume, is uh, copies are available um, uh, around if anyone's interested. Um, 
I will just pick and choose two or three themes. Um, but first, let me talk about this disenchantment all over the world. Most of the books that are available in the market, including, I'll tell you, the one major book um, that came out uh, last week, I think, uh, is, the, is a very influential journalist, uh, Martin Ulf, of Financial Times, has just come out with a book called uh, Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. I happen to be uh, reviewing that book for a magazine soon. Um, but one problem with many of these books, they deal, including Martin's, they deal with only United States and uh, North America and Europe. United States and, and Western Europe, that to be more precise. Uh, my book, in, in that sense, takes a larger global perspective. Uh, it talks about not just these countries, the democratic disenchantment both in rich and poor countries. Uh, I particularly talk about three developing countries, uh, India, uh, Brazil, and Turkey, and also, in general, some other developing countries. One major developing country I talk about, because it's not a democratic country, is China. I have a whole chapter on China, and the chapter is titled The Lure of Authoritarianism. That as the alternative model. And I show why that, is, that lure is rather hollow. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in, a couple of, in a few minutes. But otherwise, you know, this phenomenon of democratic retreat has been all over the world. It's not just uh, Trump or uh, the, what you saw in Britain, Britain uh, Brexit or Marine Le Pen. Um, uh, in, in France. By the way, in the last presidential election, Marine Le, Le Pen, who used to be called extreme right, she got more than 43% of the vote. Um, and then uh, Viktor Orban, landslide major, uh, majority in Hungary, then uh, the party, the PIS in Poland, um, and then of course the developing countries, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Narendra Modi in India, and uh, Bolsonaro until recently uh, in, in Brazil. Bolsonaro lost in the last election uh, to Lula, but what was the percentage of his vote? 49.2 percent. So, uh, at, and, and, and in fact, I was going to say that to some extent, uh, Latin America has been a bit of an exception. So, if I may echo the first sentence of a famous book of the 19th century. Uh, the first, uh, echoing that, I can say, yeah, a specter is haunting much of the world today. And that specter is right-wing extremism. There is also left-wing extremism. Venezuela is an example. But I think more pervasive today in large number of countries is right-wing extremism. And I was going to say, Latin America has been a bit of an exception, because if you look at uh, Brazil now, Lula, uh, uh, Colombia, uh, Chile, uh, Peru until recently, until the president was arrested, uh, and Ecuador before, and so on. So Latin America is a bit of an exception, but not that much. Even when Lula won in Brazil, the parliament, the legislature, largely belongs to Bolsonaro's party and other centrist and right-wing parties. Not left, Lula's party does not dominate the legislature. Same with, in Colombia. So yes, it is, Latin America is a bit of an exception, but not much, that much. Now, as uh, Sanjay already mentioned, quite often it's, there's a tendency in part of the commentators, particularly on the left, but others too, they have tried to understand it in terms of the rising inequality, economic inequality. And that too is true. That, that has happened in many parts of the world. Even when it's not rising, the level is quite high. That's true, by the way, of Latin America. It's not always rising now, but uh, it is high. Um, but in some countries, the United States, uh, India, etc., it is rising. 
I personally don't think that is, while inequality is something that all through my professional life I've been concerned with, I don't think that is a major explanation. Um, in fact, um, if inequality rise, Bolsonaro's rise, for example, came at a time of 20 years, or since the first time Lula came to power, uh, when inequality started declining, still high, started declining. Uh, I think the working class vote has changed primarily and not because they are worried about that inequality. The top 1%, it's the leftists who are worried about the top 1% or top 0.1%. I think the working class don't have an idea of how the top 1% live. They're more worried about insecurity in their own lives. Otherwise, why are they even, if they're really worried about inequality that much, why are they rallying at the banner of billionaires? Trump is a billionaire. Viktor Orban is a billionaire. Original Brexit parties, uh, uh, Nigel Farage is a multi, you know, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars. Erdogan is a billion, uh, billionaire. Putin is a billionaire. Um, the India's Narendra Modi is not a billionaire, but he's cozy with billionaires. So if the workers are really that much repelled by uh, billionaires or of, uh, the wealth inequality of these people, why are they rallying under their banners? I think that question has to be asked. So it's not the inequality per se. They're worried about insecurity, as, as Sanjay already pointed out. My whole book, is the title is World of Insecurity. But by the way, I talk about not economic insecurity alone. Let me first talk about economic insecurity, then I'll come to cultural insecurity. The other form of insecurity, in my judgment, is very important in understanding the retreat of uh, democracy. So I'll come to cultural insecurity in a few minutes. Um, but let me first talk about economic insecurity. Economic insecurity is, of course, insecurity of jobs, insecurity of incomes, and things like that. And that, obviously, is much more worrying for the worker. But it's much more than that. It's a kind of economic status insecurity. And let me explain that a little more. Even though you, are, you have a secure job, you are worried what's going to happen to your children. By the time they grow up, will they have secure jobs? And in general, there are now data to show this. And I'm, let me quote you on this data. I think I mentioned in the book. Let me quote you a, a particular finding, which I think is very important uh, to note. So some economists, um, some Harvard gr group of economists have now have this finding. They're looking at intergenerational mobility, how different generations do over time. So let me uh, cite this uh, finding to you. They show that children born in 1940, 4-0, for them, there was a 90% chance that in their, when they will grow up to be in their mid-30s, their earning adjusted for inflation will be higher than their parents, those born in 1940s. Contrast that with the finding for those who are born in 1980s. Their chance of when they grow up to be in their 30s chance to exceed their parents' income is very low, gone down over time. So that gives you, even if you have a secure job, you worry about the next generation. So that, to me, is a kind of economic security, but looking forward, Stata, economic status in, in anxiety, anxiety. And that anxiety, I think, is very uh, important. Now, what brought this anxiety, part of job insecurity, et cetera, in the United States, in large parts of the United States, uh, what is now, economists call it the China shock. The, uh, after, the, uh, after the China became a member of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, Chinese expansion of trade uh, led to 
large number of job losses in many parts of the United States and many parts of Europe as well. But there's a difference between Europe and the United States in this respect. In the United States, if you lose your job, people are not going to help you that much. There's not that the social safety net is rather patchy in the United States, not so in Europe. Even Europe, it's getting weaker than before for various reasons, but it is still fairly strong social safety net. In, in the United States, your safety net is so patchy that you lose the China shock, you lose your job, and have nobody to help you. In Denmark, in contrast, not merely there's a strong safety net, so if you lose your job, the state is going to look after you. More than that, in Denmark, there's a very strong, what they call active labor market policy, which means they will retrain you. At state expense, you are retrained for new jobs. So people will look after you. You'll get uh, unemployment benefits for a fairly long time, but they will also retrain you for new jobs. So in a sense, you are less worried. So the economic sense of economic insecurity is much less uh, in large part of Western Europe. So, and that's where I'll come back to this. That's where the, when right wing is, uh, is ideas come is more from the point of view of other kinds of insecurity, non-economic insecurity, and what I'm generally giving the name cultural insecurity. But the United States, uh, economic insecurity is very important. The cultural insecurity is also there. Now, uh, let me mention two other things in connection with uh, this uh, insecurity. And the first question I'm going to ask in this context is that things like inequality or insecurity, these used to be left-wing issues. Why are the working classes which used to be traditional voters for the left going right. So that is, the, in the, my first part of the book, that is the question. Why are the working classes turning right, not left? Because inequality, insecurity, these are left-wing issues. So we have to understand that. And I give several reasons in the book. Let me mention uh, two or three of them, and then I'll go to the cultural insecurity part. One is, this is sometimes overlooked. Uh, some of these right-wing parties are really co-opting some of the policies of the left, with the exception of the United States. United States, to this day, some policy which had been uncontroversial in most countries, the Republicans, which is now a major right-wing extremist party, um, are objecting to child assistance. Child assistance program, which is an elementary part of the welfare budget in Europe, is not acceptable to a major party like the Republican Party in the United States. But look at the right-wing extreme group in Poland. Right-wing extreme group in Poland, the party's PIS, one of their major achievements is to bring much more child assistance in their welfare program. This is the way they're co-opting the left. They, the left cannot say, look, we are providing social insurance. They are not. That's not true in Europe. That's Europe. Europe always has been, welfare state has been, for many decades, welfare state is stronger. Let me give you the example of other the developing countries where welfare state is very poor. Erdogan in Turkey. If you talk to Turkish, uh, as I have, to Turkish uh, uh, social scientists, they will tell you Erdogan has very strong programs of housing for the poor, strong programs of health benefits for the poor. Go to India, a, quite a right-wing extremist party now uh, uh, rules India, but not merely have they kept some of the welfare programs of the earlier government, employment guarantee, food security, etc. they have now introduced some new programs of their own. These are all welfare policies. Still, we, India does not have a welfare state proper, but many welfare policies have been introduced by Narendra Modi, which appeal to the poor people when they vote. So the first point is co-optation 
outside the United States. Second point, which also is overlooked sometimes, is that traditionally, when right wing comes up with all these slogans of various kinds, the major resistance, major force of resistance was trade unions. Even when people will, and cultural insecurity, I'm going to talk about that, namely uh, one of the cultural issues in Europe is immigration. Uh, immigration of culturally alien people. What used to happen earlier when trade unions are strong is they used to, uh, in a some sense, tame and transcend the nativist passions, the xenophobic passions, sometimes even racist passions. Trade unions played a very important role. Trade unions are not just wage bargaining institutions. To me, and that's linked to my cultural insecurity point, to me, trade unions are also in some sense, in this sense, cultural organizations, which over time have become weaker. In fact, if you want data, my book cites it. If you take the OECD countries, mainly the rich countries, compared 1985 to today, trade union membership has become half from 1985, not that, that long past, compared to 1985. So, and there are many reasons for it, why trade unions have become weaker. I will mention uh, some, uh, very briefly, one or two reasons. Uh, I think trade unions, in trade unions, the, there is a big divide now among the working workers because with the spread of the knowledge economy, people like you and me provide a very significant part of the working force. We are the professional workers, knowledge workers, tech workers, uh, in general, white collar workers. And over time, the gulf between them, these people, and the blue collar workers, the manual workers, the gulf has increased. Gulf has increased not merely in terms of pay, et cetera. It's also increased culturally uh, because the, the two groups have a different lifestyle. They, uh, they're very seldom now, this group, people marry into the other group. So even lifestyle-wise, the gulf has spread. Because of that, the working classes, who would have been the mainstay of trade unions, have become divided. Uh, my friend, um, who uh, has now become a rock star in, in, in social science, Thomas Piketty, who has written on inequality, he has recently, in a book called Capital and Ideology, he distinguishes between what he calls the Brahmin left borrowing an Indian caste term, Brahmin left and mercantile right. If we followed through in the Indian caste term, we'd have said Baniya left, Baniya right. But anyway, mercantile right. But I think that's, that takes it a bit too far. Because essentially, it's talking about the, the Brahmin left looking down upon the other blue collar workers, etc. I don't completely take it because it is also the Brahmin left who are more sympathetic with the marginal groups, minorities, immigrants, etc. Whereas, is the blue collar workers who are anti-minorities quite often, not always, but quite often anti-immigrants and so on. So I don't quite buy that Brahmin left business. But still, there's no doubt there's a division. The other kinds of division is that over time, particularly in rich countries, but also in some poor countries, the division between manufacturing workers and service sector workers, because the service sector is increasing in importance. And so that service sector workers are more difficult to organize. Factory workers, they're all get together. So uh, whereas service, uh, service sector workers are scattered, so difficult to organize. Another difference now in certainly rich countries, but dif this difference has been in poor countries for a long time. The difference between formal sector workers and informal sector workers. So for example, in rich countries now, uh, Uber drivers who do not have any pensions or other benefits which the formal sector workers enjoy, or the, those who are delivering food 
at uh, food or Amazon delivery people. They are informal workers, or what is the word that's used? They are gig economy, gig economy workers. Now, in developing countries like India, the overwhelming majority of workers are informal workers. They don't have any pensions, they don't have any benefits, they don't belong to the organized labor. In rich countries, they are not the majority, but they are now increasing. So again, there's a difference, formal and informal. That also is a division. So various reasons like that, trade union is weaker. So trade union's role of taming those passion, nativist passions is much less now. The only other factor in this connection I want to mention is that the left, where even when they have a power, they try to help the poor through essentially a welfareist bureaucracy. And certainly in developing countries, that bureaucracy is quite often corrupt. That bureaucracy is um, quite often uh, inept. And sometimes in India, that bureaucracy is truant. Uh, the doctor, you expect the doctor in the cleaning, the doctor is not there. He's doing private practice. Uh, teacher, you expect the teacher uh, to be in school. Uh, he or she is not there. Uh, they're in, the, they're in uh, doing uh, private tuition and all that. So corrupt, inept, and truant. So leftist idea of pushing uh, welfare measures for the poor through that bureaucracy has become the poor, the working class people and increasingly uh, unenthused about that. In contrast, in some of the countries, including India, including North Africa, uh, particularly in Muslim countries, I've also seen this in Indonesia, um, and in Turkey to some extent, in the Muslim countries, for example, these welfare services are sometimes provided by religious groups, charitable organizations. Same in India now, some Hindu charitable organization carry this. So contrast to the bureaucracy, these come out as very nice, uh, dedicated people. So that's another difference. Let me now go back to the cultural issue. So if you talk about the populists or the demagogues, they always come across as anti-elite, which appeals to the working class. But people don't follow it through. When they say they are anti-elite, Trump is anti-elite. Which elite group Trump is talking about, or all these demagogues are talking about? They're not anti-financial elite. In fact, some of the big financial elite uh, donated money to Trump, okay? So, and Trump, after winning election, he reduces the taxes of the rich. So the financial elite benefit. So all these working classes who voted for these right-wing demagogues, they're not anti-financial elite. The elite they're against is anti-liberal elite, or generally speaking, anti-cultural elite. And that's where I make this distinction. The cultural issue is very important because the working class quite often um, talk about, uh, mention, uh, they're talking about that the liberal elite, the educated liberal elite, look down upon us. There's a book uh, by my Berkeley colleague, Arlie Hochschild. I think it's called, uh, it's, it's now a few years old, about 2012 or something. She brought it out. It's called Strangers in Their Own Land. She went and collect, uh, interviewed people. And essentially, they are saying these liberals look, East Coast liberals looking down upon us. It's that sense against the cultural elite. Not, so my colleague Ali pointed out to him, what about these big oil companies which have poisoned your land? This is in Louisiana. They're not worried about that. They said, yeah, that's, uh, that happens. But they're not that much agitated. They're much more agitated about the liberals and the liberals who appease the blacks, the liberals who appease the minorities, the liberals who appease the, the immigrants. So it's the liberal elite's attitude to the, uh, to the uh, marginal groups that, that, that this socially conservative working class, uh, mostly white working class, who we're talking about. So I think we have to understand that, and therefore we have to look at these issues of minorities and immigration, which, as I already said, 
in Western Europe, immigration is a, is a major issue there in terms of uh, the cultural uh, point. In fact, uh, the, I, although I, I'm giving you the impression that as if across the world these are very similar kind of, there are differences because culture is quite different in different countries. One big difference between developing countries and uh, rich countries and developing countries is this. In rich countries, by and large, not always, by and large, the uh, working classes who are voting for these right-wing parties are older, are more rural, and less educated. If you, have a, uh, if you don't have a college degree in the United States, you are more likely to have voted for Trump. This, by the way, is not always true in, the, uh, in developing countries. In Turkey, it is true, but not in India or Indonesia. In, Tur uh, in India, Modi has support from urban aspiring young people, not the old, rural, less educated. Uh, so there is a difference. There are some differences. I talk about a little bit about this uh, in my book. But of course, there are similarities as well. The way the, the, they mobilize uh, right-wing extremism are very similar. They create a false sense of victimhood. Even if this is, um, Sanjay referred to the majoritarianism. I have a whole chapter on majoritarianism. So they, they create false victimhood. Even if you are a majority, you're going to be outnumbered very soon. Um, in France, there, there is a, there is a whole movement of right-wing intellectuals. They have called the, what they call the great replacement theory. What is that theory? Is that the, 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 the white majority in Europe are going to be outnumbered by these immigrants. In fact, I was telling San, Sanjay, and it's also in the book, there is a well-known novel um, by the very uh, well-known French novelist, Michel Welbeck. He has written 2017, a novel. It's the whole novel is a dystopian novel about the day, well, already France has become an Islamic republic. So that's the dystopia. So that's this, uh, this great danger of being outnumbered. Same thing in India. In India, writing always spreads essentially poison by telling people, look, yes, Hindus are a majority, but most look at the fertility of Muslim women, very soon we are going to get outnumbered. What they won't tell you is that in India, states which where education level is higher, there, say Kerala is one part of South India where education level is higher, the fertility rate of the Kerala Muslim woman is much lower than the fertility rate of the Hindu woman in a North Indian state uh, just because they don't have the education. So it's not the religion, it's the mother's level of education, which is the primary determinant of the fertility rate. In fact, an, a neighboring country, Bangladesh, which is poorer than India, fertility rates of Muslim women are declining at a much faster rate than all of India's fertility rate decline. So these tell you that they are misleading people, essentially spreading poison, that we are going to get outnumbered. The other thing, of course, they do is, um, uh, is, is distort and hijack history. And they are doing that all the time, essentially, uh, essentially opening historical wounds of many centuries back today to stoke uh, communal uh, or sectarian passions. In fact, I remember many years back, I saw a cartoon during the Bosnian War, when the uh, Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Muslims were fighting. I saw a cartoon in which two people are stabbing each other. And one is saying, this is for 1431. This is for 1542. So it's like historical events long time back happened, and we are now today poisoning today's world, reminding you of several centuries back. In fact, I cite in the book an actual election data from Austria. The right wing in Austria incited people by 
talking about Ottoman pillaging of the city of Vienna four or five centuries back. And that had an effect in the voting. They found, this is strange, but it's in the data. They found around Vienna, the areas which were pillaged by the Ottomans five centuries back voted more for the right wing because they got stoked. These tensions got, got stoked by, by, by this. So, and this is the cultural insecurity part that, that I'm talking about. And my, uh, I, I, I see that I don't have that much time left, but let me just say the rest of the book is really about what to do. And so I suggest lots of things, some cultural policies. For example, I want the trade unions not merely be a wage bargaining organization, they should play a role in the, these cultural issues, taming some of these passions which the right wing is, is uh, stoking. And uh, I, I, because the trade unions become weaker, it's become, there's a cultural void in which the right wing have come in. And so that, that is an important, important issue. Immigration, I suggest some policies, which, um, which I think, let me just mention, uh, I could give, go into policy details, let me do, not do that. Let me, for example, and this is connected with nationalism. Uh, so right wing go for ethnic nationalism, uh, you know, Catholic nationalism in Poland, Islamic nationalism in Turkey or Indonesia, uh, Hindu nationalism in India, etc. But that's not the only kind of nationalism. They have appropriated the sphere of nationalism by just stoking uh, ethnic nationalism. There's an alternative concept of nationalism, which I discuss a great deal. I have a whole chapter on nationalism on called civic nationalism. In a sense, India was very lucky that the Indian leaders who, uh, who after the freedom struggle, Indian leaders emphasized they didn't like the ethnic nationalism, uh, which the right-wing party adopted, the ethnic nationalism part, but the, the, the original leaders of freedom struggle, they did not like the ethnic, ethnic nationalism. They were nationalists, but they did not like the ethnic. They took a civic nationalism where nationalism based on interfaith harmony, syn syncretic nationalism, uh, nationalism based on, by civic I mean, national based on constitutional values. This is, by the way, in Germany, which has, of course, a horrendous history of ethnic nationalism. If you look at the uh, writings of the German philosopher uh, Habermas, he talked about what he calls constitutional patriotism. He says, in fact, uh, if you read details that uh, Habermas, he even has suggestions about immigration. He says, look, I'm more tolerant of the immigrants, but I allow immigration, the customs of the immigrants group, as long as they are consistent with my liberal constitution. So if the Muslim immigrant wears hijab, I'm not, nothing against it, because that's not contrary to the constitutional uh, liberal values. But if the Muslim immigrant family um, allows for genital mutilation, then I'm against, because that's opposed to my constitution's uh, liberal values. So you don't have to be multicultural in the very extreme sense. You can be multicultural as long as it is consistent with the liberal values of the Constitution and so on. So there are many, much this discussion, I discuss this uh, quite a bit in, in, in this connection. And uh, I think I've probably run out of my time. So let me just end by uh, saying that toward the, uh, much of the book is about how to improve trade union's voice labor's voice in the corporate governance, if in our discussion maybe we should go into that, and also the cultural policies that workers, uh, uh, trade unions can follow. So let me stop there, thank you. There's a lot in it, as I said, I described it as deceptively slim, and, and even your talk just touched upon a few things. I thought because the talk spoke uh, so much about what was causing, uh, as you put it, democratic disenchantment, polarization, that we could focus actually on what you didn't discuss 
have time to discuss and talk, which is the second half of the book is a really wide, diverse range of policies and measures to combat, um, to combat these challenges in the language of social democracy. So the first part of the book is about why social democracy as a form of politics has retreated in the last 30, 40 years, neoliberal age. And then it's in these last two, three chapters, you talk about policies that could actually revitalize it. Um, so I just maybe ask a couple of questions and we'll open it up because so many of you are here and so it'd be great to get your, your questions and comments. So one is, one set of policies has to do with how to empower workers. You've mentioned shared governance, uh, workers, boards, and corporate governance, and so on. Um, joint stock, uh, not joint stock, but stock ownership, and so on. Another set of policies focuses on how to rein in the power of big business and corporate capital. So you've mentioned a little bit about workers. Can you tell us a little bit about what, how you see what policies are most important for reining in the power of big business today? Yeah, in fact, I'm going to address both of the things that you mentioned. One way is to improve the voice of the worker in the running of the companies. And I think I was uh, telling him uh, before that this was an issue with in the United States presidential election time or, or the primary election time, one politician who brought it up in a big way was Elizabeth Warren. She wanted to improve the voice of the workers in corporate governance. And in my book, I cite, I think that's a very important issue for various reasons, and not just for bargaining or labor empowerment uh, in the standard sense of improving uh, working conditions of workers or wages of workers, but also in other decisions the company takes. When a decision is taken by the corporate management, they are mainly taking the decision of the shareholders. Workers uh, don't have a say in that decision. And this is not utopian. Look at the example of Germany. In Germany, you, today, uh, if you go to look at the large companies, half of their corporate governing board are worker representatives. And since that half, by the way, as a result, women's representation in the corporate boards is much better, because a lot of women uh, among workers who get uh, elected to those boards. So in what way do they handle, can they handle the economic insecurity issue better? So when the, the company is going to decide uh, where to relocate or outsource. In that decision today, workers have no say. If, um, if a company in North America wants to go to Mexico, whether it's right or wrong, I'm not asking that question now. I'm asking the question, who decides? The company decides, and then either the workers are laid off or they're asked to go to Mexico. In that decision itself, the workers will have a say, because they are now in the governing board. Similarly, and this is extremely important over time, it is going to get even more important, is innovations. What kind of innovations the company goes for? At the moment, for example, right now, uh, is going toward more robotization, automation in general. And quite often, they're replacing jobs. So the innovations are labor replacing. Why is it going in that direction? Because who's taking the decision? Is the corporate managers, corporate shareholders, at most. But if labor has an equal say, they, innovations need not always be only labor replacing. There are innovations which are labor empowering, labor using. So the research and development spending by the company may go in that direction if they have a voice. Similarly, in international treaties or international um, uh, the regulations of WTA, World Trade Organization, 
the most influential bodies are American corporate lobbies. And they, of course, represent their interest. Labor has no say in what the WTA rule is going to be. But if laborers are important in the corporate governing board, those rules will also be much more labor friendly. So I think that's the, that, that's the, um, the one economic security. And the issue that you brought up later after that was the issue of uh, how to fight the big monopolies. And that, of course, over time, uh, certainly, the, I, I don't know about the Canadian data, but probably no, it's not that different. In the United States, corporate concentration is just going up in a big way, particularly the big tech now. It used to be before big oil, then it used to be uh, big pharma, and now it's also big tech. And uh, in my book, I cite a lot of data on how corporate concentration is increasing. And this, there is now, in, with, in Joe Biden's uh, presidency, there is a change, slight change of attitude, because for a long time, anti-monopoly legislation, or what's sometimes called antitrust legislation, was getting weaker and weaker. Because the point they were making, the, the, the corporate lobbies making the point, look, why do you care? Corporate concentration is increasing. Um, Amazon prices are not going up. Uh, so as long as the consumer is happy, uh, big tech providing low cost, Google is allowing you to search free of cost. Okay, It's not really free of cost. They're grabbing your data, which is very valuable for them. They're grabbing your data free of cost. But anyway, you are getting Google search free of cost. So the corporate lobbies all used to say, look, that's what the consumers care about. I think the Biden administration made a very distinct change in this. And, and there's a whole lot of legal scholars who have, written, have been writing about this for a long time. Namely, it's not just the consumer prices. When a corporate monopoly becomes stronger, it weakens labor's bargaining power. In econ economics, there is a term called monopsony, which means how closely controlled the buyers are. And so when corporate concentration increases, it increases monopoly power in buying workers. So they can exploit workers much more. So these are examples where, where corporate concentration increase is a big danger for the, from the point of view of workers. And that's the reason going back, what I say, how to improve the worker's voice uh, to me uh, is extremely important uh, from that point of view. I'm going to ask one more question, but if it's too big, then we can just open it up. Um, there's lots of other uh, policies you mentioned. One was, at the, the, there's a chapter in the book which looks at uh, universal uh, basic income. Um, and it's very interesting that in the book, you make the argument that many economists see it as an anti-poverty measure. And in seeing it as an anti-poverty measure, they highlight a lot of risks associated with implementing it. You characterize it as an economic security measure, and you promote it on those grounds, and you say that it's actually feasible, especially in poorer countries. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that distinction, why you see it more as an economic security measure versus an anti-poverty measure. Right. Of course, since I was writing the book on insecurity, that mm -hmm. obviously came to my mind first. And this is particularly from the developing countries, because at least rich countries, certainly Canada is better than the United States, has some welfare state. As I already mentioned, the safety net in the United States is very patchy. But in developing countries, there's no welfare state, so there's no safety net. I already told you that the majority of workers in developing countries are informal. So they have no pensions, no benefits, nothing. So nothing to fall back upon. So. Uh, 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 and uh, so universal basic income is at least provide some floor to what you are going to earn, what you are going to get. So that, to me, is a sec security thing, is, is important. But why not just for the poor? Uh, first of all, the, the, in, the, in, the, in, in rich countries, uh, all calculations show so far 
that if you want to keep the existing welfare state, it's much too expensive to have universal basic income of a decent uh, universal basic income. So in order to have a decent universal basic income, you really have to restructure the welfare state, which politically will be very difficult. But developing countries which do not have a welfare state, there where the universal, so my chapter on universal basic income is um, mainly from, from that point of view. But the other issue that developing countries is important is that you might always say is, why not give it only to the poor in developing countries? You are worried about developing countries. Problem is, is and this is partly an administrative problem, in, in country, poor countries where large numbers are poor, it's always difficult to uh, predefine who's poor, who's not. So for example, for quite some time, India used to decide on who is below the poverty line. And if you are considered below the poverty line, you used to be given a card called BPL card, below poverty line card. After some time, household survey data showed that half of, of um, the poor do not have that card for various reasons. Administrative malfeasance, poor do not know about it. They'll, even if they know about it, uh, to go, the whole process is so bureaucratic, time consuming, they didn't get it. Whereas one third of the non-poor have the card. So in, a, in countries where the large numbers are poor, administratively is difficult, universal basing is much cheaper that way because you give it to everybody. That, of course, causes the opposition that you, you mean this, um, you know, if you give universal basic income, Elon Musk is going to get universal basic income, Jeff Bezos is going to get universal basic income. I answer this argument that, yes, even the richest will get. get. First of all, if the richest they will get, you can tax it away. If your tax rate is higher, some of it will come back. But more importantly, it's a conceptual point. So, do the rich have the right to have police protection? Suppose they're afraid that some crime will happen. Do they have a right to police protection? Even if they have the means to hire police for themselves, private guards, even then, constitutionally, they have the right to physical security. And in my judgment, everybody has the right to minimum economic security. So if they want, they will not want it. They will probably give it back. But conceptually, everybody should have that minimum uh, economic security. And, and this is the other thing that I want to emphasize. The other reason I come to universal basic income. So I, I already told you about the divisions in working classes, formal, informal, easier to organize, not so easy to organize, and so on. I'm looking for policies which appeal to all classes of workers. So if you have universal policies, it's not just basic income, universal health care. United States or India does not have universal health care. So if you offer universal health care, that is one policy in which both the formal sector workers and informal sector workers, this is a bridge between these two classes of workers. Same with universal basic income. Both, both groups of workers will be interested in that. So it will be easier to mobilize and organize workers. So purely as an organizational technique or tactic, I think universal basic income can serve that purpose.